Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. Uh, my name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, in this clip, we're gonna go through uh, fractional reserve lending, the boom and bust cycle, and what this current cycle looks like. And I'll give you my opinions on it. I'll give you a bunch of data here. Uh, it's a lot of data. So what I want you to walk away with, basically an understanding of how the system works, and then where we are in the system and what the Federal Reserve is doing to slow down the money supply or to slow down uh, demand. So I'll, I'll give you a, a good, hopefully, foundation to think about the markets under and where we are right now uh, in the market. So let's dive in and first understand what fractional res reserve lending is and where money comes from. So I've got this presentation I threw together. I call it where money comes from. So um, this is how money is created. This is your M2 money supply. M2 money supply. So it says uh, money, all of the money gets loaned into existence. There's two ways that money can come about. Um, the first way is when treasury bonds are created and money is created from the Federal Reserve Bank. So the treasury creates a treasury bond and at the federal reserve they create money and there's an exchange between the bonds and the money there's interest tied to those bonds that are created so they're released with interest so if if a bond is a hundred dollars and there's interest tied to it three four five percent whatever it is Someone gets cash, the other person gets the bond, but you have to pay it back with interest. The problem in this system is the money does not exist to pay the interest back. And that's the design of the system. So what happens is a bunch of money is created, but that money doesn't exist to pay the interest back. So the money has or the, the system has to continually expand. So in order for the system to survive, there's another portion where the majority of the money gets created. The other portion where money gets created is uh, money also gets created when commercial banks loan more money into existence from creating loans. This is called the fractional reserve lending, where they keep only a fraction of the reserve back and the other percentage of the loan gets created from nothing. That's where the majority of the money gets created. It says this is the bulk of where money comes into existence and it's approximately 97% of all money being created. Uh, and that's usually in a healthy system. In a healthy system, the majority of the money gets created from loans or loans in the system. An unhealthy system that's about to die the majority of the money gets created up here where uh, a company a country gets into a light late cycle a late debt cycle and they need to create money to cover uh the bond interest payments so they get into basically a hyperinflation and i, I i'm not saying that we're necessarily in a hyperinflation uh yet or i mean we we could be subject to one but that is where uh, how money is created. Those two ways. So it's 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 spending by the government, where treasury bonds are created and they get money, and also commercial bank lending. And who do the commercial banks lend the most to? Uh, this can tell us where the majority of the money uh, is created from, and I, I can get into that. So I've got a little uh, thing here. This is fractional reserve banking to help people understand. Uh, basically, your money multiplier is one divided by your reserve requirement. Um, if it's 20% reserve requirement, it's a 5x. That means that the commercial banks can create up to five times the amount of money with a 20% reserve ratio. If it's 10%, then it's 10 times. That means that the majority of the money is created uh, approximately 10 times or 97% can be created uh, through commercial bank lending. And basically what this is, is if it's a 20% reserve requirement, 
a depositor puts in $100, they have to keep back 20% of that uh, amount, which is $20. Their asset is 100. Another person goes to borrow money, they only need to keep back 20% of the 100 they have. So they borrow it out, they have $80 for a borrowing, and now the reserve is $16 of the 80 that came in. And then they continue to do that over and over and over until the reserve requirement does not allow them to do it anymore. Uh, and that, again, 20% is five times, 10% is 10 times re reserve requirements. And this is another way to look at it, the basic fractional reserve banking cycle. Uh, a deposit of $1,000 goes in the bank. They keep, this is at 10%. They keep a 10% reserve ratio of $100. They loan out uh, $900. So someone gets $900. Then that $900 gets spent in the system or somehow wait, makes its way back to a bank. So $900 goes back into the bank. They keep 90 in reserve. They loan out 810. 810 goes to another person. 810 comes back into the banking system. Reserve of $81. They loan 729. And that repeats over and over and over and over until you get up to roughly 10 times the amount that was first originally deposited. So $1,000 created $10,000 in loans. That's the M2 money supply. And there's interest tied to all of these loans. The problem with this system and the way it's designed is that you can't pay back the, the interest payments and it also struggles to pay back some of these loans. Uh, you don't have physical dollars in the system in relationship to the interest uh, payments in the system. And all of that interest accumulates and people go bust. The thing that is bad about this system is that the banks have assets and they created this money. The system here created money from nothing. Uh, they didn't put up any collateral for it. It's all just bank entries. So what happens in the end of all this is that everybody will default on their loan at some point uh, if we were to go the default route and the banks end up with all the assets. But in reality, the banks didn't put up collateral for it. Uh, there has been people who've gone to court and tried to sue the banks uh, for possession of their house saying that exact thing, that they didn't put up correct collateral. Of course, the, the system had to rule against those people because then everybody in the world would get a free house. So it's, they are technically are right. Morally and ethically, they're right where the bank didn't put up the collateral because they're creating this money from nothing. And to create something from nothing, uh, even the Federal Reserve Bank uh, is creating something from nothing is not good collateral, in my opinion. Uh, I don't necessarily care what the what the uh, Supreme Court would rule, but technically, morally, and ethically, uh, ethically, they aren't putting up correct collateral, in my opinion. So uh, the Federal Reserve requirements, that's, this is our fractional reserve requirements. Uh, banks with less than 16.3 million in assets are not required to hold reserves. Uh, banks with assets of less than 124 million, but more than 16 million have a 3% reserve requirement. And those banks with more than 124 million in assets have a 10% reserve requirement at this time, just to let you know what the reserve requirements are. Uh, commercial bank lending, this is where the vast majority of the money is created, uh, approximately 97% of the money supply that comes into existence. Um, it's when a commercial bank extends a loan. So it's not when people just spend money, it's when they extend a loan. Uh, meanwhile, 27% of bank lending goes to other financial corporations, 50% to mortgages, mainly on existing residential property, 8% to high cost credit, including overdrafts and credit cards, and just 15% to non-financial corporates, that is the productive economy. And this mo uh, moves and floats around depending on the residential real estate market and also the housing starts and how many new loans are being created against new homes. Uh, so that 50% can float between 50 and 70%, depending on where we are in the cycles. Right now, it's much higher than 50% uh, because we're going into an expansionary phase. 
and we'll get into that in the boom bust cycle. Uh, the majority of bank lending uh, comes from residential real estate. Home prices uh, are critical to the inflation debate. Uh, also, the housing starts. So demographics and new home starts are what are critical here. They're the drivers of the boom and bust cycle. Uh, population drives more homes to be built, and new homes that didn't exist before have new loans against these assets. Uh, that is what drives inflation higher and faster. It's the it's the housing starts and the demographics. Higher home prices create larger loans, and new homes expand loans in the system. This accounts for fifty percent of the loans that commercial banks make. And it can be higher than that. It can be up to 70%, depending on... Uh, it, it seems like as time progresses, that the residential real estate market is becoming larger and larger in terms of the percent loans in the system, especially under an, an inflation... Or actually, under an expansionary phase of real estate. Now, how do, these, how do some of these countries get terminal deflation or disinflation? Um, what that is driven by is the demographics. And the demographics in relationship to real estate is the cause of that terminal deflation. It's basically a declining population. Uh, declining population over time, uh, it will, you'll also see it in your interest rates. They will asymptotically approach zero because of the, uh, the population and demographics. And in Japan, they have declining population and a declining real estate market. Uh, when their real estate market went up with a small blip of demographics, their interest rates went up with it. And it was a very small little blip. Uh, other countries with demographics that have expanding populations and new homes being built have inflation. It is inflationary uh, for those uh, times. So the conclusion here is deflation inflation comes from commercial bank lending. Uh, demographics drive the need for new homes to be built and a lot more lending in the system in total. Uh, it's an expanding money supply, which is inflationary. The real estate cycle drives the deflation inflation in the short term paired with longer term population demographics of a country for overall long term trajectory of deflation or inflation in that system. The cycle we have today is inflationary because of Gen Y being larger than Gen X and a shortage of residential real estate, and that being the bulk of commercial bank lending. That is what is driving the majority of this move. Now, there was also a bunch, there was also a bunch of uh, stimulus put in the system that didn't help the cause. So we had interest rates that dropped from the medical event. We had a demographic that's larger coming up, and we had a very tight housing market where the housing starts drastically came up at the same time that they did stimulus. Uh, that's where all that inflation came from. Now, I'm going to go over really quick the boom and bust cycle and kind of where we're at in it. So we understand through fra fractional reserve lending that the majority of money in the system is created from loans being uh, created into existence. Those, those loans are against uh, new homes being built. That's the, the most inflationary aspect of the cycle. And that happens in, the, in an expansionary phase of real estate where the inventory of homes dwindle to nothing and people are motivated uh, and, and, and are going to have to buy new homes being built. That is the cycle. So let's go into the boom-bust cycle. Uh, so this is called the boom-bust cycle. And uh, real estate is the driver of this cycle. Uh, real estate's the driver of inflation and deflation, like we just went over in the fraction reserve lending. Uh, we can get signals before a crash happens, or we can at least identify where we are in the cycle. Uh, house prices, inventory, and days on the market are what give us those signals. Uh, housing starts is where the inflation comes from. Uh, the housing starts falling off a cliff also will tell us that we have a problem in the real estate market. Uh, I'm going to go over what the current situation is that we're in and the last crash and how we could see uh, that crash before it actually happened. And this, this real estate market drives uh, absolutely everything. It drives the rotation of money between assets. It drives the inflation, deflation. 
Uh, it is the business cycle, which is the real estate cycle. So the real estate cycle is the business cycle. And that's what the boom bust cycle is. It's the real estate slash business cycle. So here's the boom bust cycles uh, on the inflation portion where the demographic is larger and we have to build more homes with more loans and all that stuff. That is called the leveraging up phase. Uh, it is inflationary and it ties with credit expansion. It is an increasing money supply in, into the system. The deleveraging or the deflation is a credit contraction. That is where loans are being destroyed. That destruction of credit or deleveraging is deflationary because the, the money in the system is actually shrinking. So if someone says that it's inflationary, it means that the money supply is increasing. In a deflation, the money supply should be decreasing. And it, and it depends on where we are in that cycle. Uh, the system is inherently deflationary when, it, when certain limits are hit in terms of debts to growth. Uh, and what that means is the system, a GDP or, or a system that wants to build more products inherently is deflationary in terms of consumer price index. Uh, as we become more efficient at building products, the system will inherently produce products faster than the money supply can grow, which would push or pull the product pricing lower. And that's based off of how efficient we are at producing products, uh, which has a feedstock of commodities. Uh, the system cannot survive deflation, though. It all collapses because, and I'm, I'm not talking about product prices, I'm talking about the actual deleveraging or deflation or credit contraction in the system. It can't survive because you have more interest payments in the system than money that can pay it back. So it will default and collapse on each other. Uh, what you need or what you must have in the system is a leveraging up continually. That's why the stimulus packages continually get larger. That's why all of this gets larger and larger and larger because it has to, by design of the system, in order for the system to survive, you have to have a leveraging up or inflation. Deflation can only happen for short periods of time. They'll have to re-inflate the system if it were to get close to a deflationary collapse. Because the system, in order to, for it to survive, must be and cannot be. It must be inflationary and cannot be deflationary for any length of time. Uh, history proves that the money creators default through inflation and not deflation. Um, deflation cannot exist for any length of time. They will have to print money. They'll give stimulus checks. They will hand it out because the system cannot survive under that system or under that condition. The money manipulators, uh, their power deri is derived from the currency and the issuance of the currency. They can create money from nothing, and that's powerful because they're the ones that get to spend it first. So they must have inflation. And the way that you can position is for inflation so long that the demographics support it because that's where the money comes into the system. Government revenues need inflation to work. Uh, they default in deflation. So here's the cycle. This is the, the real estate cycle. Uh, this is the leveraging up phase in the red. That's the leveraging up and the blue is the um, deleveraging part of the system. Uh, we have a recovery phase, expansion phase, hypersupply, and recession. A hypersupply phase means that you have a bunch of inventory, a bunch of new construction and inventory uh, coming through. An expansion phase is where you have declining inventory. There's no inventory in this phase here. And new construction starts to ramp up. And then in the recovery phase is when you, you basically crashed. Uh, you're not going down any further. You're starting to recover. And your inventories are large and you're starting to eat through your inventories. When you start eating through your inventories, prices start to recover. And eventually you'll run out of inventory and you go into an expansionary phase. So what this is, is the hypersupply phase is a high inventory level of homes. A recession is a drop in prices because of the high inventory. A recovery is when the inventory starts to decline and the prices start to recover. 
you go to a spot where the inventory goes to nothing and then your housing starts kick on and you start to go into an expansion phase where you expand the current supply of homes in the system. That is the phase. Now, looking at this, this is the median sales prices of houses sold in the United States. Uh, and what you can tell is when you have the sideways movements in, this, in these markets are uh, hyper supply phases and, and recessions. The prices usually go sideways. You usually are paired with a recession. Uh, the reason you have a recession is because the money supply is not expanding at the same rate it was before it. Uh, it's a slowdown in the economy. It's a slowdown in the money supply being increased. So you'll see these declines or slowdowns in the house prices, which are typically recessionary almost every time. There's a small decline, a recession, small decline, re recession, small decline in house price, recession, decline, recession, decline, recession. And that's what these recessions are. They basically come from the real estate market. They are a contraction or a slowdown in the money supply in relationship to what happened before it. Now, we had this anomaly where house prices really fell in the late 2000s. And we can look at that, that pricing and the inventory levels of that area to show you what happened during that time frame and why I don't, I don't think it's going to be going to happen again uh, anytime soon. And we'll look at all of the of that um, area. So here's the new privately owned housing unit starts. This is also, uh, you can tell the real estate cycle through this. Uh, when we are heading lower, it is a recession in the real estate market. Then you get into a recovery phase as it comes up and stays below the red line, which is the average. The red line is the average. As you go above it, it becomes an expansionary phase of real estate. You go into a hyper supply phase and then you crash back down. And that is your recession again. This phase repeats over and over and over and cycles about the average back and forth. The size of these moves are dependent on the demographic coming through and are also dependent on the inventory levels when you went into the boom. So it's demographic driven and inventory driven. We had a major problem here with uh, new homes being built. We underbuilt the entire area over here. That's why the housing starts went so low. Uh, so we had a big problem with foreclosures. We were not adding to the housing stock during that time, the overall housing stock. And we got into a very um, underbuilt scenario on the right-hand side where we're, we're currently underbuilt five to seven million homes. When looking at the demographic, I'm going to look at this an annual percent change in the U.S. population. The baby boomers were this was this large demographic that came down and then came back up. Um, this is inflationary from the 40s. Remember, I'd have to say this: this, this here, the first-time home buyers are roughly 30 years old. So they were born in 1940, but this is really 1970 because you have to add 30 years for this demographic to come into home buying years. So this was the 1970s boom. And then after that, there was a huge bust. You could see this declining line where interest rates declined all the way till 90 plus 30 is 2020. And that's where the capitulation bottom happened and a new larger demographic comes into play. But we had a declining demographic from 1980, 50 plus 30 is 1980, all the way till 2020. And then the demographic in percent terms uh, is larger. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the, the steepness and change of this percent change in the U.S. population. Because the harder the per, this, this percentage moves up, the faster it moves up, it's a shock to the system. It's not necessarily the, the area under the curve or the volume. Uh, because if, if the area under the curve comes very slowly and the percent of your population comes slowly, it doesn't shock the system like it would if it was a large increase of, of home buyers coming in all at once. This here are your boom and bust cycles looking at it from the demographics. This is a boom cycle that's coming and another boom cycle that's coming here. Uh, remember, add 30 years, this would be 2020 all the way till the mid 2020s. 
So that's what that cycle is. And it depends on the relationship of this demographic and where we are in the housing market. Now, looking at the boom bust cycle here, and just to show you what happened in uh, right before this cycle was this is another small cycle, very small cycle in a decline, uh, declining interest rate environment. There's the cycle here. Uh, 1970 plus 30 years is the year 2000. That's the 2000 bull market. We had a steep increase that, that lasted into the mid uh, 70s. So late 2008 is where things peaked out. Remember that inflation is delayed uh, in the system by 18 months, roughly. So even though this can go mid, you know, the mid 2000s, you get a little bit delay behind it as well because the money's in the system and it needs time to work its way through it. Uh, this goes into the mid to um, this would go into the mid 2020s, but it would also extend past it by 18 months or so. And it highly depends on how fast the homes can be built uh, in the system. It's not just this is an unconstrained uh, system is what we were looking at before over here. It's unconstrained. We didn't have supply chain shortages and problems here. We do. It's going to be dragged out and delayed, I think. But that's the demographic side of it. Now. Looking at housing inventories, this is the U.S. existing home inventory. A bubble looks like this. Uh, from 2000, it was a low inventory. And we, we increased our inventories through new housing starts over time. And then we went into a bubble. This is a bubble. It's clearly seen from 2005. We increased our inventories rapidly all the way up to, this is up here, 10, 12 months. 10, 12 months of inventory. This is what a bubble looks like. You have increasing inventories. Uh, sometimes they go up very slowly and then a, a, a rapid increase or an increase up into 10 months uh, and over is a bubble. You could see that a bubble was forming in 2006 before the bubble even happened. And this is what's important to get from this. A bubble can happen, but you want to stay long in your commodities until a blow-off top happens. The blow-off top uh, happened in 2008, but we saw that a bubble was coming in 2005 and six. So you kind of have to stay with it, even though the inventories are increasing. And as long as the housing starts are going up and are above the average, you want to stay long in the stocks, in, in commodities. And the reason we're looking at all this is this is the driver of why money rotates in the system. More inflation, higher interest rates, money rotates out of stocks and bonds into commodities. And right now, when we look at this, we are not at a bubble phase. We're at a boom phase right now. We are out of inventory. We're at very low levels. Our inventory levels, even though we may go up, are still below the 2000 inventory. We are still lower than the beginning of the bull market that happened in the 2000s. That's how messed up our housing market is. And this could very well go up and, and interest rates could slow this down. It can't stop it, though. It can only delay it, in my opinion. Uh, this is the U.S. foreclosure starts. The problem with the, the last bubble is foreclosures were going through the roof. They were very high. This is bad because what happened is there was a lot of homes that got loans that people could not afford. Uh, and that was the majority of loans that were loaned out at the middle of the 2000s. So we had foreclosures rapid, rapidly increasing at the same time our inventories were increasing as well. If you notice, 2005, 2005, and this is where the inventory came from. It was from foreclosures. This is a bubble. That's what a bubble looks like. This is not a bubble over here in 2022, quarter one. Now, the foreclosures can obviously start to go up, but they have a long way to go in order for me to say that this would be a bubble. They have a long way to go. It's got years to go, in my opinion. This is with a whole bunch of people getting absolutely garbage loans and interest rates going up uh, where people couldn't afford it even if, if their payments just went up. Uh, this also had interest rates going up at, uh, with it, and the people couldn't afford the loans. They got underwater, which means that they owed more on the house. They couldn't sell the house. And then they just foreclosed on it and said, take the house back. We are in a completely different situation than that. Uh, we have, one, not many foreclosures. Two, we don't have those adjustable rate mortgages in the system. We have fixed rate, uh, fixed rate loans with much better borrowers. 
The borrowers have money, they have income, and they are in a 30-year fixed rate loan where your payment doesn't move on you. So it's a completely different scenario, at least in the United States, than where we were before. Uh, this is days on the market versus median sales price. You can see that there's a direct correlation here. Uh, as your days on the market increase, especially rapidly, your median sales price goes down. As this starts to recover and your days on the market start to decline and go into a declining uh, days on the market, which is basically your inventory is getting depleted, uh, your, your median sales price starts to rebound and go higher. Uh, we are very low right now on days on the market. And uh, that median sales price continues to go up. And this stops in, in November of 2020. But I'm just showing you this relationship of days on the market, uh, which is not in a bubble, and sales prices. Here is the value of homeowner equity in real estate in the United States. And what has to happen for a bubble, for an actual crash to happen, is this equity needs to actually decline some. This means that your houses are being under are, are being put underwater. At least some of the houses are. The further this declines, the more people become underwater and you'll get more foreclosures. So we had a, a huge foreclosure happen in this region all between 2005 and 2011. This is your foreclosures between 2005 and 2011, and that's where all of these foreclosures are at. So in order for those foreclosures to happen, uh, that has to go through a far further decline of home homeowner equity because we haven't even started to decline. This has been moonshotting up higher. The system is out of whack at this time right now. And it takes a long time for us to get out of whack to become a buyer or a seller's market into a buyer's market. And homeowner equity needs to really drastically decline before we start to see homes underwater and before we start to see a rampant increase in foreclosures. And most people have interest rates that they fixed at a very low rate. They have lots of homeowner equity. And just recently, has interest rates really started to increase, and they increased very rapidly, which means not many people have loans with high interest rates. It's very, very few people. So this is going to take time, and the interest rates increasing can definitely slow down the market, but I don't think it can crash a market. We would need home prices to fall, and we need a lot of people to, to basically foreclose on their house. And with fixed rate mortgages at very low rates, I think it's going to be a lot more difficult for that to happen. This is the months of inventory. This is the sellers and buyers market, just to show you what it happened in 06, 07, and, uh, uh, 08, and 2010. We were in a seller's market, which was a very bullish market for housing. And you can see the inventories rapidly increased into a buyer's market. It went all the way up and touched 12 months of inventory in 2010. This here was a scenario where we overbuilt new homes and we had foreclosures all happening at the same time. And we went into a drastic buyer's market. So when we look at that, we had home equity going negative for people. They were underwater on their loans. Foreclosures started to increase rapidly because of that underwater scenario. And they couldn't sell their house because we had too much inventory in the system. That inventory came from a bunch of homes being built as well, all at the same time. So foreclosures and us overbuilding in the housing market resulted in a buyer's market of greater than seven months of inventory. Problem is today is we have no homes. We have no homes to sell. So we can't get to that scenario. We are in a deep. One month is off this chart. We went below this chart on a seller's market. That's why the house prices were increasing so much. We need the housing starts to kick on in a big way. And what can slow this down, though, is interest rates rapidly increasing. So it, it won't blow up the market like it did back here because we don't have the inventory on the market, at least not yet. And Inventory doesn't necessarily build homes. 
We had too many homes in relationship to the population that's out there. We're not in that scenario. We don't have too many homes in relationship to the population. All they're doing is capping the demand for the house through interest rates at this time. They're holding the market down through affordability. They're, they're, they're trying to hold it down to slow down the inflation in the system. Remember, inflation is new homes coming onto the market with new loans. But if you increase the interest rates to a very high level, you're going to slow that, that adoption rate or that, that creation of loans in the system. They're slowing down the inflation in the system. So the demographics in real estate. Demographics is the ultimate driver for the real estate demand. Real estate demand drives up home prices and housing starts. The housing starts are where new loans come into the system, driving a leveraging up of a credit and inflation system or market. The real estate loaning and lending gets money into the hands of those that can spend, and that is money into the system. So when we look at all this data, and this is the data on everything, one can conclude that we are not in the same situation as the mid-2000s. I don't think that the house prices are just going to fall off a cliff like they did in the 2000s. I think it definitely can slow down. And the loaning into the system, the housing starts can also slow down because they're making things unaffordable through interest rates. They didn't fix the problem though. The problem still exists where the demographic is larger and that there's not enough homes in the system. So the problem still exists. We still are, are, are short homes in the system by five to seven million. We still have low inventories. I don't think they can blow up the housing market just by interest rates. I think they can slow it down. I think they can basically bring it to a halt if we were to raise rates to 10% or something. They could bring it to a halt. It could even slightly decline, but I don't think you'll get that, that huge selling pressure with not many homes in the system. It'll just all come to a stop or slow down, I think, for a long time. And, and I think that's exactly where we're at. I think we're at a very we're at a slowdown in the real estate market where things are starting to slow down, uh, that the rates of increases will slow down, and eventually it will drastically slow down because of interest rates. And I don't know if the mar- I don't know if they can stop necessarily the market. Now you're going to start to see rates go up and down. I think, and it depends on how much money's in the system and if they have to create money to cover interest payments because of the interest rate. So this is where they get into a really weird situation. The really weird situation is if they hold interest rates high, they can't because the interest rates will start to have an impact on um, the servicing that debt. So if they if they leave them high, they're they 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 basically have to create money to 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 cover the service payments on the debt. That's what the the government's going to have to do in the Federal Reserve. So that's inflationary. If they, if they lower the interest rate down to cover those payments, now the housing market blows up. It goes up into this huge uh, bubble. And it will be a bubble at some point at the end when we overbuild it. But we're not there yet. It's going to take years. That's how out of balance the housing market is. So the Federal Reserve is backed into a corner. They can kind of hold everything down for a while with interest rates going up uh, dramatically. But the imbalances in the system are not fixed. You still have these large market imbalances between supply and demand. So if they lower the interest rate, the affordability goes up, and then the housing market and housing starts kick way back on, and they they, they, they get into this inflationary environment. If they hold interest rates up, they can hold down the demand for housing uh, if they hold the interest rates up at a high enough level. But they also have an impact that they can't service their own debt, (laughs) and they're releasing bonds at higher and higher interest. Uh, interest rates. So they're they're basically in a corner here for a while where they either have unaffordable, you know, they, they can't afford to keep the rates because of the debt in the system, uh, or uh, the housing market will blow up if they lower rates. It'll, it'll, it'll put that inflation into the system. So they, they're in a toughy, tricky spot here, the Federal Reserve is, with interest rates. Another thing is we have an energy crisis all happening at the same time. So this is money coming into the system. This is inflation with money coming into the system. But in the system, with interest rates being held high, money wants to rotate into different assets. That's the inflation into the system and uh, interest rates. 
So the housing market has the Federal Reserve pinned with higher interest rates. <clears throat> There's no houses that can solve this problem. They're not building new homes. Un it's unaffordable at this time, so to speak. So they're pinning, <coughs> sorry, they're pinning interest rates higher, which is causing money to rotate over and into commodities and energy. So this, this will happen so long they pin this rate high. Now, if the rate starts to come down, the driver of inflation from the housing market continues. And then it'll pin money back into commodities. So I am long commodities so long that we have this imbalance in the housing market. And that's where I remain long because the, that 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 fundamental the fundamentals in the real estate market are bullish until the homes get built, and the homes being built are inflationary. That's where the money and loans come against those new homes. So this 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 market it's gonna it's gonna ebb and flow. It's gonna slow down and speed up depending on the interest rates and what's happening with uh, how much money is being created to cover the, the payments. So it's, it's, you've got the, the, the inflationary driver of the Federal Reserve and the government covering the interest payments on the debt. And if they lower interest rates, then the housing market kicks back up and we start getting inflation from there. So they're, they're pinned against a wall with inflation. And commodities are the good investment, in my opinion, uh, for this inflationary environment with increasing interest rates. And it will shift money differently. Money's not going to want to go into bonds uh, so long that interest rates are going up. So I think that we're going to have commodities do very well because of the situation that the Federal Reserve is in and the government. They either have to create money to hold the interest rates down on, on yield curve control or whatever they do, it's inflationary, basically. And if rates come back down, you get inflation from the housing market because uh, house prices will go up. The affordability goes up and new, more new homes will be built. And then you have the energy crisis, which then uh, will keep your consumer price index high. That's what they measure inflation from. Uh, and money will rotate into uh, oil and energy related assets because we have an energy crisis, which is also on top of all this. An energy crisis basically translates the money that's been created here, which they're trying to slow down and hold the demand down. That money will translate and shift into energy. But energy is going to have problems for probably five, six years. So this whole thing, they're, they're pinned. They're pinned against the wall. They can't create the money long enough because it's inflationary to cover the interest payments. If they lower the interest rate to cover the payments there, the housing market goes up, which is inflationary. And then interest, uh, um, interest rates want to go up because of that. And they have a problem in energy and energy is what takes the money in the system and translates it into the consumer price index through energy. Because energy is used to create everything. It's used to harvest commodities. It's used to convert commodities to usable products. And we have a, a crisis there. That's the entire market conditions uh, set up at this time. And to me, they're kind of screwed. I don't know how they're going to get out of this in the next five, 10 years. And that's what I'm looking at is I'm looking at you know, the overall markets, as they hold interest rates high, they're starting to choke on themselves. The, and what I mean by choke, we could see a decline in stocks and bonds for a short period of time. And that time frame can, can drag everything lower because everything's leveraged in the system. There's a lot of margin loans in the system. So that leverage in the system is dragging or pulling everything lower uh, in the short term. But in the long term, in the fundamentals, they're pinned against a wall where they can't get out of it. They either hold the demand down for a while and kill the stock market and bond market through higher interest rates, but they're holding the inflation down doing it. If they lower interest rates, the inflation comes back and you're back basically to the same spot that we are today. Money rotates differently in this, in this scenario where it rotates away from bonds and stocks and into commodities and precious metals. So that's your rotation of money. That's the, the market conditions and setup. Ratios just tell us where that money's flowing and where the value is in the market. And they might be actively suppressing the price of precious metals and other things because that can also tell that there's a problem in the system. So they're trying to hold all these things up in the air all at once. This is the, the situation we're in. This is what it looks like. 
So if I were to sum it up, I think commodities will go higher, but they could go lower in the short term. So I think commodities will go up longer term because of the supply demand imbalances in the market. We have an energy crisis, which will also push the price of all this up. So we have major demand supply problems in the system across all, the whole energy sector massively. We've got this problem in the real estate market of underbuilding in real estate, which is driven by demographics and the supply demand imbalance in real estate, which is money coming into the system. The Federal Reserve is in a tough spot because you've got the energy crisis, which is translating the cash in the system into the CPI, which is the consumer price index. And they have to hold interest rates high enough to slow down the inflation coming from the real estate market. If they hold the interest rates too high, then they have a, a debt problem because we're coming towards the end of a debt cycle where they're going to have to print money to cover the interest payments, which is also inflationary. So basically, you get in a spot where everything is going to be inflationary for the next five years. No matter what they do, uh, they can delay the market, but I don't think they can stop the market. And uh, with the energy crisis there, all of that money that's in the system gets translated back into higher consumer price index numbers, which is what everyone looks at. So that's the scenario there, guys. And short term, yeah, we could go lower. We could do some crazy stuff because the interest rates are going to start to kill the stock market and the bond market. We're going to see selling pressure come back off there. And that money is going to eventually rotate into stocks and commodities. And it has to transfer through the dollar first. So we could see the DXY get stronger in the short term. And then eventually, I think it will roll over and get weaker as that money gets deployed into commodities and precious metals and other uh, assets like real estate. But it, right now, we're just in a transition period. Uh, that transition period also happened in the uh, 2001, 2002 timeframe. And, and that's exactly the same spot that we're in. It's the same scenario as the NASDAQ bubble. Uh, we have tech stocks and all these growth stocks selling off uh, because of higher interest rates, and we're seeing the money rotate. And then during that money rotation period, that is when you start to see things go wonky. We get pushed and pulled and, and people get scared. It uh, doesn't mean the commodity bull market's over. It just means that we're going through a transition period where money's rotating all over the place. That's all it means. All right, guys, that's all I've got. Uh, give me a thumb up for the content. If you guys like this analysis, um, I talk about this a lot. Uh, so a lot of these charts are also posted on the website below. You can become a platinum member. Uh, if you want to become a platinum member, you know, definitely check out the link below. I've got all this posted on my website. And, uh, you know, guys, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Uh, definitely join the channel if you like uh, this type of analysis and how I tied this all together. This is the th part of the thesis. So I'm basically just going over the thesis again uh, and, and giving an update real time. All right, guys, that's all I've got. We'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.